Hi, this is Natalie Hoffman of FlyingFreeNow.com, and you're listening to the Flying Free Podcast, a support resource for women of faith looking for hope and healing from hidden emotional and spiritual abuse. Welcome to episode 30 of the Flying Free Podcast. Today, I am tickled out of my mind to welcome a very special guest from the UK. Her name is Natalie Collins, and you are going to adore her, not just because of her accent. Natalie is a gender justice specialist who's been working to address domestic abuse issues for almost a decade, working directly with women subjected to abuse and domestic abuse perpetrators, and training church leaders and congregations on domestic abuse issues. She has delivered keynote addresses both nationally and internationally on the subject and has spoken alongside archbishops and UN representatives. Natalie is also the founder of the 50 Shades is Domestic Abuse campaign and has appeared on national television, radio, and printed media talking about abuse, consent, and women's rights. She has further written several articles and book contributions on domestic violence and is the author of the widely used domestic abuse pack for UK churches, the Restored Church Pack. She has a brand new book out called Out of Control, Couples, Conflict, and the Capacity for Change. So let's get started. Natalie, I want to warmly welcome you to the Flying Free Podcast, and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy life to share your knowledge and insights with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So I heard you for the first time a few months ago on the Unbelievable Radio Show where you were having a conversation with a complimentarian pastor, Phil Moore, and I will put a link to that show in the show's notes. I, I did share it widely on social media at the time, but I'm gonna, it's worth sharing again. Um, the title of that show was Me Too and the Church, and it was answering questions like, um, does the church need a Me Too movement? Does egalitarian and complementarian theology help or harm men and women in the church? So, but I, what I want to do in this interview is a couple of things. First of all, I'd really like to hear more about your book, why you wrote it, who it's for, and how th- these particular women that are listening to this show are going to benefit from your story and the things that you um, offer in your book. And your book is not just your story. It's, why don't, well, why don't we just, well, okay, first, let me just say this. So that, I want to do that. But then secondly, I'm hoping that towards the end, I'd actually like to do a hundred things with this interview, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll just try to do two. Towards the end, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how, um, how patriarchy, sometimes there's confusion about what, how does patriarchy and complementarianism, what, what are their differences and how are they similar and how those ideologies actually contribute to the abuse of women in the church and even cause women to actually stay in what are abusive relationships because of their theologies, the things that they believe about that. So this is a lot to cover, but let's start with your book. Yes. Um, So my book is called Out of Control, Couples, Conflict and the Capacity for Change. I I didn't ever intend to write a book, but um, one of the things that I'd noticed was there were quite a lot of bad books (laughs) um, from a Christian perspective about um, relationships and marriage and that kind of stuff that um, particularly, I mean, a few years ago, I read um, Stormy and Martin's The Power of the Praying Wife. And um, and yeah, I mean, that's kind of the pinnacle of, you know, bad books. And so from that, like, was really aware that actually, like, people could write really bad books about abuse. And that was really my motivation in ending up writing a book. I had no kind of real desire to write a book, but here I am. And and so um, I wanted to write something which would help the helpers, really. So the book is primarily for family and friends or church leaders or pastoral supporters of somebody who is with an abusive partner or has been with an abusive partner. Because I think, you know, often um, family and friends just feel so powerless when we're going through this stuff that they don't really know what to do. But I've written in a way that's really accessible for people who are going through it themselves, who are kind of trying to make sense of what's going on in their own life or um, anything like that. And it's designed to be very sort of... um, gentle but also very um 
it, it is quite full on, but I kind of, I, when I started writing it, I planned to only share my story at the end because I find that um, I do quite a lot of media work and I find that people have like a box that they want to put me in. They either want to say, this is the woman who's got the story um, or this is the expert. And the idea that you could be an expert and also be somebody with a story is like really anathema to them. And so I, I, I usually tell my story towards the end of when I speak at events or do training because I don't want people to package me as this is the abused woman um, mm. and, and actually I think one of the really interesting things is that when I tell my story towards the end of a three-day training or towards the end of a talk or something people are always really shocked because they're like you I can't imagine you would be abused I have had some I've been told that I'm too tall to be abused I'm too, um, <laughs> too I'm too young to be abused that I'm too um, I'm not ugly enough to be abused um, <laughs> you know all of these really it's really interesting one guy said to me you some small shriveled up thing I could imagine but you and um, and so I think there's there's a really interesting thing that when we we have this idea on our head of who somebody who's abused looks like and that's not only detrimental if we're helping somebody it's also detrimental if we're being abused because we don't understand that we are being abused because we think right. well I, I'm, I'm not like those women over there who get abused I'm strong and I'm capable and he's not like those people those men who are abusive he's just having a difficult time at the minute and so one of the big problems with the abuse word is it's like a putting an, 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 an exploding a bomb into somebody's life if, if we start to kind of talk about abuse too early <laughs> people are like oh no it's not abuse because if it's abuse I have to do something if it's abuse it's not I can't I can't just keep going um, and mm. so and so, um, yeah, so I, I found it really interesting to, to not make my story the, the kind of focus of what I do because I'm actually an expert. I'm, I'm, I describe myself as a gender justice specialist and some people are like, well, what is that? And I'm like, well, I kind of made the title up. And uh, it's after about a decade of working with domestic abuse issues, sexual exploitation, pornography, um, female gender mutilation, doing lots and lots of different work, generally on issues to do with men's violence. And, um, and so I, I wrote this book and I intended to just tell my story at the end but I found that as I was writing it in chapter one I'm like oh you should have some cake isn't it hilarious how oh we should and, and was really sort of catty and then was like oh people are going to think I'm really insensitive with having this kind of quite light um making a few jokes tone and I thought the only way that I can get away with having a quite light tone throughout the book is to kind of say very early don't worry I'm what I'm one of these people so mm. I'm not just a horrible mean person making light of a serious topic whenever I do training um the uh I, I always say as one of my expectations that if we're going to talk about domestic abuse or any of these really tricky issues, I'll say um, one of my expectations is that we'll have fun. And one time this woman came up to me in the break and had a massive go at me. And she was like, it's not acceptable. Fun is not acceptable. This is a terrible issue. And I was like, well, look, you're talking about this issue for one day of your life. <laughs> my whole life is, is this stuff. And so we, I, I actually there's a real power in laughter and a power in fun to break the power of this stuff over us. Because when we can laugh at this stuff, it it's not as powerful um, right. and so yeah so the, so the book kind of weaves my story throughout it's about um about 20 or 30 percent of it is my story which I can tell you a bit more of later if you're interested and then the rest of it is kind of talking about what is abuse and I think we have this tendency to talk about abuse very conceptually so people say oh you know physical violence emotional abuse um sexual abuse and actually those things when they're conceptually described feel very intangible and we can really distance ourselves as we come from the word abuse and we can say well it's not abuse because um, and so for me um, the first kind of part of this is actually trying to make abuse much more tangible and the way we do that is talking about what does somebody do to another person to be abusive and so we focus on kind of the different tactics that um, a perpetrator might use and so the four, there's eight different characteristics that I use when I talk about abusive behavior um, and I use the work of a guy called Albert Biderman who worked um, to look at the ways that uh, pr prisoners of war were um, were abused and he found eight different ways that they were abused and the reality is that you can only there's only a certain number of ways you can abuse somebody and whether that's a prisoner of war whether that's a partner whether that's sexual exploitation um, it is there is these eight different categories apply across the board and so and in some ways it can be really powerful because a lot of the time we'll minimize the ways that our partner is treating us or our husband is treating us but when um, when we hear that these tactics 
politics are actually what prisoners of war are treated like, suddenly it seems much more serious and it's not something we can minimise so easily. Um, and so I talk about these types of behaviours as different characters. So I talk about somebody being the humiliator who makes us feel dirty and ashamed. They might abuse us sexually, they might mock us in front of people. And then when they've mocked us and, and laughing at us and we, and we uh, object, they then mock us some more and say, oh, she can't even take a joke. So there's this, this shriveling up inside that happens when that humiliation occurs um, or is perpetrated. Then you've got the threatener who makes us scared, who threatens to tell people our secrets, who threatens to hurt the children. You've got the exhauster. Now, exhaustion as a tactic of abuse is something that I've rarely heard about or, or read much about, but it's really, really key because when he's keeping us up late at night wanting to talk about his feelings, when he makes us, you know, when he wants to have sex in the middle of the night, when he's using, you know, kind of ensuring that we're doing all of the household tasks, all of the child care. And, it, and when we're exhausted, it's very difficult to make good decisions. You know, having kids is exhausting itself without them having somebody who's deliberately trying to keep us exhausted. Um, the brainwasher who controls um, the narrative, he, and most people are familiar with the term gaslighting. So this making us feel like we're going mad, not giving us space or time to think. Um, the, the, the brainwasher will minimise, deny and blame their behaviour. So they'll minimise it. It was just, it was only, um, they will shrink it down to make it less bad than it really is. And we'll end up saying the same stuff. I was speaking to um, somebody I knew and, and, uh, and she said, oh, you know, my ex-husband, I mean, he was a little bit abusive, not really very much, because, I mean, he only had me up against the wall, wall by my neck once. <laughs> and I was like, shall we go back to the point where you just described being strangled, which could be attempted murder, and how we call that mm -hmm. just? But we all do that. We minimise it, because minimising it makes it feel safer. The smaller we can make it, the safer it feels, even if that's mm -hmm. not necessarily true. We de He'll deny it. I never even touched you. I didn't go anywhere near you. You're imagining things, and he'll blame it on, you know, it's it's um, my mental health issues, it's the children, it's stress, it's my job, it's my... Um, one woman said to me, it's because he's got diabetes and his low blood sugar makes him abusive. Um, I, I did say, you know, there's there's no website that I've been on that says symptoms of diabetes, including being abusive. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. You know, but, um, but, and so blaming, but the main thing that Ep blames is us, it's, it's my fault. If, he, if I hadn't have done this, he wouldn't have done that. And, mm -hmm. and, and actually, the, it's, the understanding why we blame ourselves is really key here and the first reason we blame ourselves is because he blames us and so we learn to take on that narrative and um, because the abuser all the abuser does is designed to um, avoid him having to take any responsibility um, so it's partly about that he blames us it's also that we live in a, a wider society which blames women for everything you know when uh, when um, there's a, a case where a man has done something wrong it's probably his mother that um, you know <laughs> it's probably right. his, his issues with his mother so women are always at fault in society um so so there's the wider societal blaming if we're christians there's the whole christian cultural blaming of women which starts all the way back with eve it's all eve's fault <laughs> so you have all of these kind of theological and cultural narratives of blame of women and um, but then also the really key thing that i think i found very helpful to understand and is that one of the reasons why we blame ourselves is it makes things safe psychologically safer because if it's my fault then i can fix it right. if it's my my fault then I have some control in this situation if it's not my fault then I'm powerless to affect change and that is very very scary and very very psychologically difficult to deal with and so you know well-meaning people say to us no no it's not your fault and what they're doing is they're stripping us of the only power we believe that we've got mm -hmm. which is to think it's our fault because if it's not my fault then what, how do I change this? If, if I can't fix it and change it, then that's really very difficult. And so understanding blame with, and self-blame is really key. And so I think we have to be really kind to ourselves and recognize that our body and our brain are really cleverly giving us a way of surviving, that self-blame is a survival tactic. And it's not necessarily the truth. The truth is not that it's our fault. It's definitely not our fault. But recognizing why we have this tendency to think it's our fault is about recognizing that for the brain and for our bodies and for our psyche, 
powerlessness is much more scary than being at fault. And so kind of recognizing that can be really helpful in, in how do we then take steps to move forward. So, so yeah, so um, to finish through the, just a whizzing through the other rest of the characters in that. So you've got the, the brainwasher who, who makes us feel like we're going mad. So the brainwasher, we're only acceptable as bad, sad and mad. So bad, it's all our fault. Sad, pathetic, useless or mad, just totally mad. Um, and they might hide things or move things. I, I've worked with so many women who said, um, I, I've recorded him on my phone because he'd always say he'd said stuff and then deny he'd say it later. And so they then play the recording back saying, actually, you did say this. No. I recorded you. Um, or, you know, um, he might... Um, uh, kind of tell her that she's going mad you know you go mad you are you know you, you don't you don't know what you're doing um and the first thing we think is not he's trying to make me feel we go I'm going mad the first thing we think is I am going mad <laughs> um yeah. particularly because we as women we live in a society which tells us we're irrational and so already we are we are culturally conditioned to believe that we are likely to be mad rather than he's likely to be manipulating us I, I there's a really interesting story with a guy who is a self-confessed gaslight and he was saying how he started to be begin making his girlfriend think he was she was going mad and he said what happened was he was cheating on his girlfriend and um he didn't want her to um and she kind of started to be suspicious of it and so he um when she accused him the first words that came out of his mouth and it wasn't planned was you go mad you are like you're paranoid you think that I'm having an affair I'm not it's you you're paranoid and to his surprise she said Oh, 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 am I? And she believed that narrative. And so he suddenly was like, oh, oh, I can get away with this. Mm -hmm. And so that was, um, so he learned that this affected what he wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and so that recognition that so much of what the abuser does is trial and error. Um, so you have the almighty who uses extreme acts of power, um, violence or aggression to convince us that he has all the power. And that might be about violence or sexual violence, but equally one of the, there's um, a trauma theorist called Judith Herman, whose book Trauma and Recovery is yeah. amazing. And in that she says that when, um, that somebody is not truly broken by the abuser until they have been forced to compromise their own integrity. And so what often happens is the abuser will work out what is most important to this person, what are their values, and they will do what they can to, to break our integrity. And that might be about set, making us do sexual things that we don't want to. And that might be about lying. My ex-husband, I was a Christian and he said he was a Christian, but wasn't. Um, and he... Um, uh, he knew that my faith was important to me and very early on in the relationship he would try to make me call him God and it was a way of trying to break um that power of of my integrity and like make me you know kind of sacrifice my faith um and so uh, the tricky thing is that uh, only the person themselves will know what that thing is that they've been made to do that is breaking their own integrity and um, when I, I've, I've written a course for women who've been subjected to abuse called the own my life course it's being piloted in the UK at the minute and one of the exercises we do is we have this list of values and you could do it online you could google um you know a big list of values and, and i get people to kind of read through them and work out what are their top 10 and then to strip it down to their top five which is a bit problematic in itself to try to work out what are my five core values and then i ask them to work out what are the ways that the abuser has tried to make you has tried to undermine those values in your life and for every person that will be different because that our values are, are, are personal to us and so the almighty is about destroying our sense of self in ways that show that actually they have all the power and we have not i um i came across a story about a little boy who'd been um sexually abused and the perpetrator said um that he had a camera in every light bulb and so if the child ever disclosed um he would know and after that you, you kind of go around and you think and you look at light bulbs and you think where is there a place where there aren't light bulbs mm. and so it's this sense of all powerfulness of omnipotence that leaves us thinking well there's no hope there's no hope I can't escape this um, you also have the demander who will force or manipulate us into doing trivial or pointless tasks who makes constant demands of us you have the isolator 
And the isolation is really, really key because when somebody isolates us, the only narrative that we have is theirs. And that makes it very difficult to make good choices when the only person that we have is them. And they might isolate us by saying, you're not seeing your mother anymore. I hate her. Um, And all these kind of narratives of mother-in-laws being a nightmare obviously feeds into that. Um, But also it might be subtle and they might say, oh, how well do you know Natalie? And you say, yeah, no, well, why? And they go, no reason. I just wondered. And suddenly there's a seed of doubt very subtly being planted um you know encouraging us to have children and then refusing to support our care of those children and so then we are isolated because we've got kids and particularly if they then undermine our parenting so then we can't actually get anybody else to look after the kids or nobody wants to spend time with our kids because our kids are a nightmare because of his behavior um so isolating us um uh, is a really key part of what an abuser does and then the last one is the nice one um and this is a tactic and that's really hard to hear from most people because they want to believe that no sometimes he's nice he's not always bad but even the nice behaviors are tactics Mm -hmm. and one of the key things that abuser gives us is hope Um, and hope is a really necessary part of the abuser's tactics because if there was no hope we probably would get out but because there is this sense of hope or this promise that things are going to change being nice to us going back to what they used to be like and we think now this is it this is it they're back to who they used to be Um, and the other thing is that what happens over time is when somebody's abusive over time what they do is they um they the the level of abuse and the level of awfulness to us means that this the least nice things that they could possibly do kind of just the tiniest nice thing takes on epic proportions i explain it a bit like if somebody denied us access to a toilet for 24 hours if they locked us in a room and they said you're not allowed to go to the toilet for 24 hours when they let us go to the toilet our first response is not going to be you x y z you know you awful person how could you not let me go to the toilet our first response is going to be thank you so much for letting me go to the toilet because um, because what we're grateful for and what, what takes on um, kindness proportions is very different when somebody has stripped us of of all the the, ge- the general nicenesses that you would expect in the world. So even their nice behaviours. So so the, the book starts by kind of going through these tactics of abuse and talks about what kind of unpicks them, looks at what these look like, looks at how they, they these different tactics. We'll use the children, we'll use um, finances, we'll use the Christian faith to do that. And then it goes on to look at why why somebody perpetrates abuse and then kind of be, goes on beyond that to look at how do how do we kind of work out how to leave what's going on in our brains and our bodies how do we um how do we co-parent with somebody who's been abusive whether we're still with them or whether we've left how do we raise children so they don't become abusive what do we do about masculinity what we look at theology so it's quite a comprehensive book mm-hmm. um, but it is you know it does have me ranting about cake and saying fun things throughout so it's not entirely <laughs> miserable <laughs> Yes, I, 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 in the other, I was just listening to an interview, uh, another one, another person was doing an interview of you and yeah. sorry, I've got a child at my door. I have this <laughs> sign on my door that says, do not disturb. I am recording, but, um, so hopefully this child will not come in, <laughs> but, um, in that interview, you were talking about sex as being like a chocolate cake that you put in the refrigerator yeah. And I thought that was such a great, I love pictures. I, I like to use them. I like to hear them word pictures because they make, they illustrate, they bring to life realities in a way that we can really grasp and see. And I noticed that you do that a lot and I'm really excited to get your book. I've not read it, <laughs> I looked at it on Amazon. So let me just quick jump in here and explain to my reader or my listeners too, that Natalie and I connected on Twitter and I still don't have any recollection of it. (laughs) I put it on my, I, I don't even remember, like, I don't remember anything about it, but I put it on my calendar that I was going to do a podcast interview with her. And so I, and then I went on a vacation and I came back and I saw, Oh, I've got this interview. And I was trying to jog my memory. I didn't write anything down. I don't know why. Usually I'm pretty organized. And I went back, I searched through Twitter. I couldn't figure it out. So I Google searched and I real I saw, no, no, actually I, I reached out to Natalie and I said, Natalie, I've got this interview with you and I can't remember anything about you. And she sent me a link to her page, which I will put in the show notes. She's got a page with just bazillions of links to all of these different um, articles she's written for lots of different people and interviews she's done a lot. She's very she can cover this topic very comprehensively. And anyway, I um, went over there and I saw her picture and I was like, 
oh my <laughs> word, I remember seeing this lady. I loved her at the <laughs> interview that you did with Phil. And um, I remember thinking at the time when I was watching, I don't know if it's okay to say this, but I remember oh, yeah. at the time I felt like in the interview, you were so gracious and so articulate. I was so impressed. And Phil was, he seemed kind of condescending, a little bit um, patronizing. And did you sense that in that interview? Do you remember that? Did you ever, did you feel like that? Or did you feel like it went pretty well as far as like your vibes that you got from him? I think it's a really interesting thing because when I'm um, when I'm kind of in like either speaking or or doing whatever these kind of stuff or or a debate like that, I suppose I spend all the time kind of just discerning what the ne- how to respond to what they're saying. So I don't really assess. Okay. The, the, the okay. <laughs> I'm just so busy. Like, what is the next thing that I need to say? And right. So, I, mean, I think it's. I mean, it's really interesting because Phil. I mean, he's a really nice guy, and and actually, that came about after there's a uh, the biggest complementarian uh, network in the UK had a conference um, that was sort of rebranding branding complementarianism um, that happened last uh, last year, and I was the only. I went as like this. <laughs> what is this woman going? Hi. I kept I kept having to disclose I was egalitarian and every sort of small group discussion I'll be like oh my oh, goodness yes. and it was so it was very it was really interesting and I went because I really wanted to hear what was being said and, and they were kind of they've rebranded it in the UK as complementarity so that you know to try and distance themselves from some of the particularly the, the US fen- fundamentalist end of complementarianism and okay. to sort of themselves from John Piper etc and um, so they were like they've given it a new name and everything and they said it's more like a, it's like an orchestra um, and all this kind of stuff and so I I sort of connected with Phil a bit there and and there is a sense that you know he he he's committed to addressing um domestic abuse and he's not um you know like he's not a bad guy as as most of these people are not bad people but right. um, but I think, you know, he's just, um, you know, I think there is this sense that a lot of this stuff only works in theory when you come from his perspective. So it's great for him because he's a man um, and he is, uh, you know, kind of fits the profile of the sort of man he's allowed to speak. He's white and he's able-bodied and mm-hmm. he's heterosexual and all that kind of stuff. And so um, so he's never had a challenge. It's never been a problem to him that this stuff exists. And so I think for him, there's this kind of nice naivety and and I guess you could just you know kind of you described it a bit as kind of patronizing or condescending because there's like this idea that well if you could only understand like how beautiful it is like you know you're saying that scripture is problematic but it's beautiful and I'm like it's beautiful to you because you've never had it used to keep you being abused it's beautiful to you because you don't have to face the consequences but actually the reality is that that scripture and the bible and what we understand of Jesus is that the priority and the centering is always the approach it's always the people who've been damaged and hurt yes. and so it's that the frustrating thing is that kind of the core of scripture is how how do you know and obviously there's lots of scriptures that kind of don't fit this but but fundamentally it's about love and it's about those who are powerless and and all that kind of stuff and so it's very really, really frustrating when christians are perpetuating this idea that well if you just understood it the way i understand it if you just understand how beautiful female submission is and, and male head it can be beautiful so well yeah it can be beautiful to you because you're a man and you're not abusive you know and and it works great and I think you know the thing about complementarianism is it works really well for men (laughs) and for women who don't have a call to leadership and they can all get together and they can be like oh it's lovely isn't it great oh yes we all love it (laughs) but actually if you're a woman called to leadership you don't fit um and and you can't and 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 it's and the problem is that then not every woman is called to leadership and that's fine um you know I had a friend who you know is a clinical psychologist and a complementarian church saying but I, I don't feel called to leadership so it's fine for me and I'm like but it's not fine for me right. <laughs> and exactly you know, and so if it's not fine for me it's fine for you then what does that mean because we are supposed to be interconnected as human beings so you don't yes. get to kind of abdicate responsibility for for what your theology is saying to me and the guy who is the main speaker there he's um he's kind of an up-and-coming theologian his name is uh, Alistair Roberts and he was kind of the big uh theological kind of articulator of all this stuff and um 
And I spoke to him afterwards and like, we've been friends actually for quite a long time and I didn't even know he was complimentarian for years because <laughs> wow. he's so clever. I was like, he must be, he must be egalitarian because, because yeah, how could he not understand that? And then discovered he's like a raging complimentarian. I mean, he even knitted me, like he knitted me gloves once. Like he, like, I mean, I thought, because I was just, I felt really, it, it's been a really interesting dilemma of this person has knitted me clothing, like this man has knitted me clothing and which, I mean, you know, in the US, it might be quite uh, like crazy the idea that a complimentarian yes. I mean, that might yeah. in itself be like, what? But anyway, so this guy's knitting me gloves and I really like him. And it turns out like he's, his theology and what he's perpetuating is horrific. But anyway, so he, um, in this conference, he's like, you know, that basically we don't need to define mas- manhood and womanhood, that when that it'll just ooze out of people and they'll just perform gender in the ways that we understand it, because that's what true liberation is. And afterwards I said to him, you're saying that like we don't need to define this stuff that we will just be our true selves and it'll be wonderful but the 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 framework that you have provided means that who my true self is cannot flourish in the framework you provided and so how does if your if your framework cannot work for who god made me to be then there's something wrong with your framework um and he he, he just couldn't answer so so yeah so it's been, it was a really interesting it's been interesting and you know i'm grateful for phil for being willing to have that conversation because there are lots of complementarians that wouldn't sit down at the table with me and I think we need to be sitting down at tables with each other. Yes. Yes. I, and that is what I loved about that conversation is it was, I mean, he was gracious too, that he was not at all antagonistic in any way. It's so funny. Cause when you, when you said the word beautiful over and over, it's so beautiful, it's so beautiful. <laughs> that, that was something that was like glaring in that interview. Yeah. I was like, come yeah. on, please don't say that again, because it's really not, it's, that's what destroyed me. That yeah. destroyed me and it's destroy. I watch it destroying hundreds and hundreds of women every single day. So that's not, it's not very beautiful, honestly. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, what you were saying before about the, uh, the chocolate cake in the fridge analogy, um, just for people who kind of got the glimpse of that and then we moved on just um, <laughs> to make a bit more sense of it. So there is, um, there's a, a number of kind of Christian leaders in the UK, um, male ones who, um, who have used this analogy when I grew up in Christian culture, grew up in a Christian home. And so um, within kind of the youth camp sort of, you know, kind of teaching about sexual purity, there would be this teaching on sex is like a chocolate cake. You put it in the fridge and you stay out of the kitchen. That was like actual teaching that we got taught. And um, one of the, one of the things that that meant was that I didn't have a framework for consent. I, I'd learned that premarital sex is bad postmarital sex is good, the end. Um, and, you know, mm. and actually, if you save sex till marriage, you'll have mind-blowing sex on your wedding night and it'll be amazing and wonderful. Yeah. And, and just to kind of, you know, clarify, it takes 10,000 hours of something to become an expert. So your wedding night is not going to be the best sex of your life. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, exactly. <laughs> and that's not to say it's going to be terrible or it doesn't have to be terrible, but like, let's be realistic about this stuff. Anyway, so... <laughs> You know, the vagina is an organ. And if you haven't done much with it before, you know, <laughs> all sorts of stuff might go on before sex becomes pleasurable. But anyway, yes. uh, anyway so, um, so when I, um, when I was uh, doing, um, yeah, so, so what happened was when I was 17 and I'd grown up in this Christian culture, and one of the things was that, like, for me, I thought that the way that I manifested the gospel in my culture as a countercultural Christian, which is what you're taught to be in the church, was mm-hmm. by being a virgin, by not having sex. That's the thing that makes me prove to all my non-Christian friends that I am a Christian and that's how I'm going to win them for the Lord. You know, so like, it's, and it's not necessarily that somebody said that. I didn't stand in a church where some, a youth leader stood up and said, kids, your virginity is the, the pathway to salvation. But that's, you, can, you know, as a girl growing up in the church, that's all of what you learn. And so yes. I was like, this is it. If I tell them all I'm a virgin, I, was, I went to a college um, and college um, in, in, the, in the UK is like 16 to 18 year old, not in university. And so at 16, mm-hmm. I went to a college. It was the first time I was in a non-Christian environment because I'd gone to a, um, a Church of England primary school, a Catholic secondary school. All of my friends are Christian. So I was like, look, it's a mission field. I can evangelize them all with my virginity. Mm-hmm. And so, so I go into this college course and, and this was it. Like my, my being not having sex and committing to not having sex was like the definitive thing about being a Christian teenager. 
um, not like, you know, kind of build a relationship with Jesus or anything else. And, you know, I mean, that was also there, but it was, you know, sex was the thing. Right. And so when I then met a boy um, who, uh, he was also 17 and he'd said he'd recently become a Christian, which was the other, the two things you get taught about, taught about sex is, you know, sex is a chocolate cake you keep it over there that's it the, the other thing you're told is make sure that the person's a christian like as long as they're washed in the blood that's all it doesn't matter whether they are a good person it doesn't matter whether you have anything in common with them as long as you're not unequally out it's fine right. that's, so, so that's I, not true yeah, that's it that's it so i'm like so that's fit that's 100 percent of christian sex and relation education two things don't have sex, <laughs> make sure they're christian so I, here I am. I'm like, right, I've done the first bit. I'm a virgin. I've declared it very, very strongly to everybody. And um, and also he's he's um, he's a Christian, so we're fine, we're fine. And he was also really very, very attractive, which, you know, at 17 was, was also useful. So <laughs> here I am, like this, uh, you know, 17-year-old. And I say to him, like, I don't believe in sex before marriage. I'm not going to have sex. And he was like, oh, that's, you know, that's okay. Um, but then proceeded to coerce and manipulate me into sexual activity to the point that within 12 days, he'd um, manipulated me into having sex with him. And he did that through a process of um, what uh, some people would call love bombing. And people, you may or may not be familiar with that term and and, um, people can Google it. There's various different parts to it. But one of the things is about high intensity. Um, Another thing is about kind of being, kind of taking over somebody's entire life so they don't have any time to think for themselves, spending all their time together, making big grand gestures, talking about forever love very quickly, all of these Mm -hmm. things that mean that it's very difficult to get any perspective. So he was like... an expert at kind of this level of intensity and pushing me into greater and greater um sexual activity and because all I've been told is you just need to say you don't want to have sex and then that's it (laughs) I didn't have any skills to recognize that what was happening was sexually abusive and so Mm. within 12 days where he had essentially um coerced and forced me into sexual sex um I then felt terrible and I didn't think oh I feel bad because he has sexually coerced me I thought I feel bad because I've betrayed Jesus. Um, mm. And and that was, I didn't have a framework for premarital sex that could be, feel good. And so I didn't know that this was sexual abuse because I didn't even know you could be sexually abused in an intimate relationship. I thought it had to be an adult to a child, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so the problem with the chocolate cake analogy is it doesn't give any differentiation between whether you go in the... T- fridge and eat the chocolate cake or whether somebody drags you into the kitchen and opens the fridge and shoves your face in the chocolate cake and you're you know both of those things are very very different contextually Mm -hmm. um and, you know, particularly when we understand the impact of pornography on youth culture and on adults and, and how it is normalizing very graphic sexual violence as well. Um, and so it was really, really difficult to to kind of, I, I then thought, well, the way that I solved this is I've got to marry him. I'd had, you know, I'd known him for like three weeks. I'd slept, he'd, he'd coerced me into sexual activity within 12 days of us actually starting a relationship. And then I'm like, right, well, the way I solve this is God would want me to marry him. I'm like 17. <laughs> This is like, you know, 2003. This is not like the 1950s. And I'm like, I've got to marry him. Um, And so within six months, I was pregnant because he refused to use contraception. Um, And actually, it's really important that we recognize reproductive coercion is a form of abusive behavior. So um, we we know that pregnancy is a high risk factor for somebody being abused. But what we don't often recognize is the amount of women who the abuse involves them being coerced into pregnancy. And that might be that he pricks holes in condoms. It might be that he lies and says he's had a vasectomy or that he's got a low sperm count. It might be that he takes the condom off during sex. Um, And so, um, or that, you know, we are in a religious culture which says that women don't have the right to control their fertility as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are all sorts of things which lead us, you know, that your job as a woman is to have babies. So we feel like we can't control it or we're in a religious community who think contraception is bad. Um, And, and in the UK, I think um, there was data that came out and I'm, I'm, I want to get the stats right. I think it was, it was definitely over 50% of women who had been, um, who had been subjected to abuse by a partner, over 50% um, acknowledged that they'd been subjected to reproductive coercion. Um, So, you know, and and actually we often won't realise we've been subjected to reproductive coercion until we become pregnant. So if we happen to not get pregnant, we won't always recognise it. And so recognising the way that we may become, our pregnancy is a result of that abuse. And as you can imagine, that's very complicated, isn't it? That suddenly we are, we didn't choose to have that child, but now we love that child. And now that child is a weapon that the abuser can use to harm us 
further. Um, and it's a really very complicated situation. And there are some abusers who will keep their partner pregnant over and over again. And that, that keeps them stuck. They can't ever leave then. And, you know, you've got kind of quiverful movement and other theological kind of Christian arguments to justify some men doing that, which mm. perpetuates all this stuff. And so six months in, I'm then pregnant and uh i um within and then we we got married when my daughter was three months old um and he was horrifically damaging to me he made me think that i was worthless that i was stupid ugly and fat and that everything that he did wrong was my fault um he made me do every imaginable thing sexually and i was compliant because i thought that doing it with consent made it somehow better and if i said no i knew he'd make me do it and so there's kind of like well if i kind of proactively consent to things i don't want to do it can't be abuse um and so it's not you know and it, and and also there's a kind of sense of thinking no I'm going to convince myself I like doing these really humiliating things right. because, because then it's not really abuse and so my identity becomes caught up in some kind of hypersexualized stuff and it was it was really really atrocious he was che- cheated on me regularly before um and after we got married and um within uh, six months of us getting married he started um having relationships with teenage girls and ended up convicted of sex offenses against teenage girls um which then meant I was married to a sex offender but all the way through this I was like I need to love him and by loving him the vehicle of my love will mean that Jesus comes in and saves him and that my love is, you know, that through loving him, Jesus will save him. And and that will, how this thing will be resolved. Um, and I kept on thinking, if I just forgive him enough and love him enough and give enough. And what I was doing was enabling him to sin, not, you know, not, not in my own head. And it wasn't my fault, but um, it was perpetuating, you know, why would he change? And one of the reasons why somebody is abusive, and I think, you know, most people who've got an abusive partner or had an abusive partner, I know for me, the key thing I want to know is why, why is he doing this to me? Um, and if I can understand why, the other reason we want to understand, one of the reasons we want to understand why is because we want to fix it. And if we can get the formula of what is the problem, problem we can work out the solution and so we jump on things like it's because of his childhood or because he's stressed or it's because of us because they're all solvable but the reason why somebody is abusive is two things the first thing is because it is hugely beneficial and people don't want to hear this no society don't want to hear it and when we're being abused we don't want to hear it we want to believe that he must be some sort of tortured soul you know that we have this idea that hurt people hurt people and it's really hard for him and our christian narratives of sin and brokenness and everything but actually fundamentally he's abusive because he gets what he wants he gets somebody who does whatever he wants he gets sex on demand he gets to have the status of being a good parent and a good spouse without actually doing anything you know this is like you know he never takes responsibility he gets to blame everyone else and and we all kind of run around doing everything that he wants and and then and then and take all the responsibility for anything that goes wrong like who wouldn't want a life like that Yes, yes there is a sacrificing of kind of in empathy and intimacy and all the things that you kind of as a human being want but in reality the benefits are huge and so we really have to be honest about the fact that yeah he's getting what he wants here so that's the first thing it's hugely beneficial to be abusive and the second thing is um it's about the beliefs that he holds so somebody who is a belief abusive holds believes two things they believe that they own their partner and they believe that they're entitled to do what they want to their partner Yes, and so ownership and entitlement are the roots of abusive behaviour. So um, I, often we kind of hear kind of abusers being described as jealous. Um, I don't use the word jealousy because I think it's that humanity is capable of jealousy. It's possessiveness because they believe they possess us. So it's about ownership. I own my partner, and because I own her and I own my children, I have the right. I'm entitled to do what I want. Um, and so if we want to see effect change we have to challenge those beliefs of ownership and entitlement and and when somebody's abusive that's fundamentally what's going on they they're not somebody who's a psychopath they're not somebody who doesn't have the capacity for empathy they're usually very emotionally intelligent and capable of communication which is why um they can convince everyone else they're not abusive Mm -hmm. (laughs) and why everyone else is manipulated because they're not they you know these are not emotionally incapable people or you know one of the things i've come up against more and more is people 
people saying, yeah, but my partner's autistic and autism being used as a, as a reason why somebody's abusive. Now, mm. somebody who's autistic wants to control their environment to feel safe. Somebody who's abusive wants to control their partner. Um, so, you know, somebody who's autistic might say, I don't want to go to the party. Somebody who's abusive says, I don't want you to go to the party. Mm. Um, and so just recognizing that. And, and I, more and more I'm coming across women saying, oh, yeah, but it's because he's, he's on the autistic spectrum. Um, but actually, uh, kind of, it, that the reality is that somebody who's autistic is actually more um, likely to be abused than they are to be an abuser. Um, and so it's really hard to hear this stuff because we want to believe that that he, you know, if we could just get him the right counselling or the right support, or maybe it's his anger issues, then we'll resolve this stuff. But it's it's simply not about those things. And actually what counselling will do is a counsellor will generally be sucked into his narrative and collude with him. Um, what anger management will do, will just train him to control himself even more because he's not actually angry. He might appear angry at these points, but, you, you know, if someone turns up at the door, he won't start screaming at them. They'll turn it all down and be very nice and lovely to them. And then as soon as they've gone on start screaming at us again so there is a level of control I worked with um one woman and uh she realized that he knew what he was doing when every time um he'd kick off he'd smash her phone and then he couldn't then um track her and, and obsessively control her through the phone when he wasn't with her and so this one time he kicked off and he went for her phone and stopped and then went for something else and she was like how many seconds he knows what he's doing he's not out of control and exactly. um, you know and also if, if if we've got a partner who smashes things what you will notice is the only thing he smashes are things that are not important to him right. so he'll smash our things um and I, I know a police officer who went to a house and then um, the police had been called by the the husband who said my wife's gone mad she's smashing up the house and the police arrived at the house and this police officer was well enough trained to see the only things that had been smashed in this house were her things and from that they were able to ascertain that this guy was lying um so this is you know so all of this is really really key but understanding that this is about benefits and beliefs is is crucial to to start to affect change and um i spoke to a woman recently who had um realized her partner was abusive had separated from him and he was used continuing to control her through the children and she was saying i just don't know what to do you know i just want to have a nice going on i want things to work out okay um and and well the problem is that an abuser is always motivated by power and so the question we need to ask when we're interacting with an abuser is not why is he doing this to me? But how is he trying to gain power in this interaction from me? Mm. So an abuser works in the, the currency of power. And so every time, every interaction, whether they're being nice, whether they're being horrible, whether they're involving other people or not, every single thing they do is about power. And so what we need to think about is, how are they trying to get power from me? Is it by being nice to me? Is it by trying to use the money? And then what we need to look at is how do I stop him from stealing my power? Um, you know, it may be that we need to um, say, so for instance, often we might think if they're harassing us through the phone, well, let's get a new number. But what that'll mean is they'll just turn up at the door because they can't get hold of us. So what's actually a more strategic thing to do is get a second number so that we can give all the people that we care about this second number, but this old number he's got, and we can check that phone whenever we want and he's no longer um taking over our life and our phone so that you know so it involves kind of very idea. Yeah, it's about operating very differently. In the course that I've written, we have this activity um, with traffic lights and you've got three three different um, types of uh, kind of sign. You've got an, a road, you've got a red light and you've got a green light. And so what you do is you think about with the road, what is the action that you want to take? Um, and this can be while we're still with the abuser, it could be when we've left the abuser. So it might be, I am we're still with the abuser and I want to go to college. It might be, I've left the abuser and I want to put appropriate boundaries in place with my children. Um, and so you do the right, you put that on the kind of road and then you say, right, the tra red traffic light is what is he going to do to stop me taking the action? So uh, if it's, and then you list all the things that he's going to do. So if it's going to college, he's going to tell me we don't have enough money. He's going to tell me that uh, the kids need me at home. He's going to suddenly want to have another baby. He's going to, you know, and you just kind of think all the things that he could do to stop me from going to college. Or if I've left him, you know, he's going to start turning up at the car, you know, turning up and revving the engine. He's going to, um, he's going to start demanding uh, things. He's going to start telling the children horrible things about me so the red light is like what is he going to do to stop me moving forward on this road and then the next once you've worked out all the things he might do you then need to look at on the green light what are the things that i can do to to 
plan around that red light because I think what we are often doing when we're with an abuser or after we've left an abuser is we we assume the best all the time we assume that he's just going to wake up one day and be nice and he's not and so we always have to presume that there is an inevitability that there is always going to be a red light on that road and our job is to work out how do we turn that red light green and what do we do strategically but we can only do that if we start to think about what is the other obstacles he's going to put in my way and it is a different way of thinking about this but by doing that it's a very effective way of of starting to think strategically and starting to operate in the same space he's operating out of rather than trying to pull him into a space in terms of our good intentions our niceness and it's horrible because we don't want to we don't want to be setting boundaries we you know we want to be able to you know kind of this is the person we're supposed to care about our love they're the father of our children we want to have a nice going on but the reality is that's not possible and that's something we have to mourn and make space for but that's the reality so good <laughs> I, lo- I, I love the practical ideas that you had um okay so i want to wrap this up by yes. circling back to some because i my what i really want people to understand <clears throat> who have, who have been survivors. And what I would really like the church to understand eventually is how, um, how their ideas about men and women and their ideas, um, about roles of men and women, how that actually, well, in some ways it is the definition of abuse. Cause when you think about it, like when you said, um, that, that they're about ownership and entitlement, that when you when you tell a couple who's just getting married that you know man your role is to basically own and <laughs> make all the decisions and lead and be the head of this woman and you tell the woman your role is to follow this man and to give him your power aren't we just setting them up now if they're a really nice couple and the man is really nice and he he just is not the kind of person who wants to take power away then maybe that would work but in a lot of cases, these are just people who are being inundated with this kind of teaching. They're kind of being set up. It almost seems like even you could, you could even start with a guy who just has this put into his head and then the woman and the woman also, and they fall into these roles and it actually turns into an abusive situation because like you said, it seems to work. It works for the man. It doesn't work for the woman, but she's doing it for the glory of God. And she's, you know, any suffering that she does, she can always spiritualize it and say that, well, I'm doing this, you know, I'm suffering for Christ. And so, I mean, I don't know. I think that's one of your agendas too, is just to help the church understand and see the, how this creates a doorway for abuse to get in to the church. Yes. So this is why it's crucial to understand that the core of abuse is ownership and entitlement, because one of the challenges we have in the church, and one of the reasons the church is so terrible at dealing with abuse is because they misdiagnose abuse. So they misdiagnose abuse as a relationship issue, as a marriage issue. And so they respond to abuse whenever it emerges as, oh, this person is, this this couple need marital counseling, they need communication issues help. And they think that, you know, and even when they deal with abuse, they think it's a relationship problem they think it's a an an emotional incapacity problem that is an anger problem so the the problem is misdiagnosis and while relationship counseling is helpful while counseling is helpful anger management might be helpful you you know it's I, i i describe it a bit like Yes, um, if you need to treat treat a Veruca, you use a Veruca treatment, but that's not going to treat somebody who's having a heart attack. And that's not about demeaning counselling or marital counselling or only any of these things, but it's saying that's not going to help somebody who's being abused um, and it's not going to help the abuser to change. And so we need to deal with our misdiagnosis problem in, in Christian culture and in Christian communities. Um, and so that's why understanding that the core of abuse is the beliefs of ownership and entitlement because when we realize that, we start to recognize how complementarian theology is part of the problem. Because if you believe that men and women fundamentally have different roles in which the man has more power, and you can say as many times as you like that um, that that's about power to serve, but the reality is it's about having more power. It's about having more cultural capital. It's about the cultural coding of what men do as being powerful and what women do as being less powerful. And by doing that, you create 
a context in which you are perpetuating beliefs of ownership and entitlement. And like you say, that that may not happen if you have somebody who is um, a kind, caring, compassionate person. You know, the, like the vast majority of functioning complementarian marriages are functionally egalitarian in practice. Right. Yes. You know, so they look, you know, they would say, yeah, we believe that the man makes the final decision. And if you ask them, how many times does that happen? They'll say, oh, it never happens because we talk about it until we work it through. But theoretically, we could do that, you know. And so what you find is that the, the, the ones that are, that were, operate functionally egalitarian. Um, and and it's actually, you know, and, and so it's not, the problem is when there are people who are perpetuating, this has been perpetuating really the ownership and the entitlement. Because if you say, to somebody who already believes that they are entitled over their spouse if you say to them well as the head you are in charge and have the final say that is a horrifically problematic thing that is just inviting him to to be abusive and so you know, in any, and you can't say, oh, well, yeah, but we don't have any abusers here. The re- the year is as much abuse perpetrated in the church as outside of the church. And the yes. only difference is women stay longer. It's not that um, men are less abusive. Um, and, and, and the perpetuating of these patriarchal narratives. And it's not fair on men either. Like God, God did not design it so that men have to hold it all on their shoulders. And, and there's a real mm. irony in masculinity that masculinity is constructed as strength. And what that means for men is that they are not allowed to fail. And the irony there is that the only way you become strength, strong is by having failure in your life. Mm. The only way that strength is developed is through resilience being built. And that resilience is built through falling down and getting back up. And so you have this masculinity that is constructed as strength that is actually hugely weak and fragile because it has never, because boys are taught, no, man up, don't cry, keep it all together, hold it all in. And so they, they've never actually failed and and come had to get back up uh, they've avoided circumstances of failure I talked to a guy who played American football and he said when he had the opportunity to play professionally he chose the worst team where he could be the best player rather than the best team where he'd be the worst player and he knows that that meant that he didn't do as well as he could have done because he was because his masculinity demanded that he had to be strong at all times and so these men a are not being given the skills to become strong ironically you know the amount of fragility among kind of Christian male leaders is, you know, off the scale, isn't it? Um, but also on top of that, you have um, not just this fragility, but also this, this ideal that is being put forward that men, you have to hold it all together. You have to have it all on your shoulders. And you know what the gospel is? The gospel is saying, I can't do this on my own. I can't, I can't make it alone. I need Jesus to help me. Um, and, and all of this perpetuating of headship, of hierarchy, of patriarchal masculinity is perpetuating a message which says men have to have it all together and that's the absolutely against what the gospel stands for which is saying i'm vulnerable i'm weak i can't do it and i need god to help me excellent i think okay so those of you who are listening i I don't know if you're thinking what i'm thinking right now but i I, every time Natalie opens up her mouth and says something, I feel like, okay, now I want to go off in this direction and we could talk for another hour just about this one topic. We have touched on so many different aspects of this whole issue. And I want you to know though, that you can actually find out more of what Natalie has to say on all of these different issues that we've touched on in this episode. And I will have a link to her website in the show notes. So if you're listening on your phone, you can go to flyingfreenow.com, go to the podcast and episode 30 with Natalie Collins. And in those show notes, I will have all the links that you need to get to, to dig into more of what Natalie has to offer online for free. You can listen to her talk. You can read her articles. She's got all kinds of stuff. Um, And so anyway, Natalie, I just want to thank you so much for being willing to spend an hour with us today. This has been a great episode. I've learned so much and I'm really excited to keep connecting with you and help you in what you're doing also. I don't think this is going to be the end of our discussion between you and me. And um, yeah, I'm really excited about what you're doing. I I really love you. I love you (laughs) so much. Uh, it's been so great to be on the on the show and I'm so glad and um, thank you for having me especially when you don't even know how you ended up with me <laughs> I 
know. I feel bad about that, but this, <laughs> that's the craziness in my life. I had nine kids. So I, wow. I have six still living with me and I'm remarried also. And my life is absolutely like crazy busy. So it, it doesn't surprise me that, that that happened. I try to have some safeguards to <laughs> like, you know, like, well, I've got like post-it notes all over my desk here. That's yeah. one of my main safeguards. But for some reason, you slipped through the cracks. And I don't know if I just figured I would go back and figure it out <laughs> or what. I have no idea what I was thinking. But clearly, there was a mind glitch there. And But I'm so glad that we connected. I was When I figured out who you were, I was really excited. And I thought, well, if I would have known that back then, I would have been <laughs> counting the days for this episode. <laughs> Anyway. Oh, it's been great. So yeah, and and um, I, all your listeners can obviously um, contact me um, via my website or um, whatever else. I would say that um, because I'm based in the UK, if people want to read reviews about the book, they can read them on um, the Amazon.co.uk version of the site. Um, because and rather than the um, no, but it's not as familiar to people in the US yet. Oh, um, yeah. So if people want to kind of read about the book before they maybe buy it, they might find it read because the reviews don't go cross over annoyingly. <laughs> right. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, no, so it's really annoying. So yeah, so if anybody does read it and then wants to review it in the US, please do, because apparently yes. it matters um, having reviews on there. So um, yeah, if you find it useful, um, do put a review up. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for having me. And I, I'm looking forward to further conversations with you as well, because I think that's All right. been great. And, and the rest of you fly free. <laughs> <laughs>